You know, when I reviewed the very first episode of the show, I made a joke out of a line from the bad adaptation of The Time Machine, the one with Guy Pierce. You're a man haunted by those two most terrible words. What if? I was not expecting this show to actually pull plot elements from that movie. So what if? Episode 4, what if Stephen Strange lost his heart instead of his hands? And I can easily say this is the one I've liked the least. I have found something to like in pretty much all the other ones, you know, despite having little criticisms here and there. This one, no, I don't like it. I don't like it for multiple reasons. Let's start with the fact that this was by far the most predictable one. Um... You know, the thing was, when I watched uh, the first one, the Captain Carter one, yeah, it was kind of predictable once you realize it was repeating the beats of the uh, original Captain America film. But, like, I didn't realize that until a decent way into the episode. Here, literally as soon as I realized that the heart that he was losing was metaphorical and it was Christine and, you know, and he was going to be fine, I immediately knew two things. One... He's going to turn evil trying to fix this. And two, it's probably going to result in the end of the world. And guess what? That just left me to sit there for a half, a half an hour waiting for the inevitable. And that is what happened. Like, I didn't know exactly how it would go down. But ultimately, I didn't really care. Because I knew where it was going immediately. And it had no real twists internally. Other than, you know, surprising me by ripping off a bad movie. By pulling the whole, I must go back and change this this thing that ruined my life. Ah, but you can't because the thing that ruined your life is what set you on the path to even have the ability to go back in time and change it. Da, da, da. And like, look, maybe they didn't pull it directly from that movie adaptation of The Time Machine. Other stories have probably done it before and since. But that's still the first thing that leapt to my mind. And it's just... Uh, it's a super, it's the most predictable, paradoxical outcome if you're going to do that. And yeah, I just, uh, it doesn't help that Benedict Cumberbatch, <sighs> look, I don't love his American accent. I've never loved his American accent, but it doesn't bug me when I'm watching him perform live action, because as I've noted with some of the other actors that they bring in to voice these parts, he's used to having his full body to use as an acting tool and actually there's a lot that goes on very subtly often with him with his face with looks in his eyes just little things that this animation fails to recapture and when he's stuck with just the voice it, all i keep thinking of god that accent is weird so that's just what i kept thinking the whole time through the other actors uh fare a little bit better in terms of their vocal performances, you know, Tilda Swinton, Benedict Wan, Rachel McAdams. But um, Stephen's the one we spend the most time with. And it's the one that I... It, it's it's not totally flat. It do, It's not um, on the level of Sebastian Stan's back in the first episode. I'm sorry I keep going off on that. I know he's not a voice actor. I know he tried his best. But, like, that was a really flat reading. And it's my point of comparison within this series. So it's not the... The problem isn't that this one's flat. It's just... Because of the accent he's doing, his voice is actually kind of the weakest part of his performance, even in the live-action movies that he's in. It's just everything else he's able to do as an actor compensates for it, and it's all gone here. So that doesn't help. Um, and then... Okay. So... I'm... I'm really of two minds on the entire... Pre like, set the paradox element aside. For a second, because predictable saw it coming was bored, and maybe and maybe like this is my own basis of entertainment. Maybe the reason this bored me is the same reason I bowed out after the first season of The Walking Dead. I watch and go, I've seen all the things this has to offer elsewhere before. Maybe I'm too marinated in things like Doctor Who and various time travel science fiction stories to be caught off guard by this. Maybe that's why it was predictable to me. Maybe people who aren't as marinated in that stuff. Got more enjoyment out of it. But I can only talk about the perspective I have. And I was bored. But setting that aside. Setting the time travel, the loop, the paradox. All that aside. And 
just dealing with the thematics. I'm really kind of torn about, well, okay. I know I don't like it. I'm trying to figure out to what degree I don't like it. This whole basically losing Christine broke him. Because on the one hand, well, on the initial, this irritates me, hand is just that premise reinforces this general notion that I push back on a lot uh, as a sentiment in society, the idea of another human being completing someone. And I'm not saying that like people don't have those kinds of relationships or that they aren't meaningful or important, but I, I really dislike the ubiquity uh, of that just as a message because if it is at all possible for you, you really need to be a complete human being on your own. And if you're that dependent on another person in order to function, like, at all, then, like, that's not a good thing. And you could argue that the episode is trying to make the point that it's not a good thing to be that dependent, since Stephen goes so far off the rails based off the fact that he believes he can't function without her. So you could argue that it's making a point against that, except it never really makes the point flat out. And I think the idea that they're trying to critique this aspect doesn't really hold up because still fundamentally at its core, it's saying that Stephen losing her broke him. So if now if it's just a matter of watching how far he falls, then it's already an unsolvable situation because he was already that committed. He was already unable to be a complete person without her. So everything's already screwed. And watching him just see how bad he goes, which also goes over the top. And that's another thing. The and, uh, This is one of the issues I tend to have with romantic subplots, especially in stories that where the romance is not the point. So, you know, action movies, superhero movies, etc. One of the main things that I dislike about romantic subplots in general is that way too much weight gets placed on them. Like so often in movies, especially movies, um, where there isn't the time to devote to really hook me in on a, on a relationship between two characters, I find myself doing one of two things. I find myself when a character is like, oh, but I love them and, you know, then does whatever, usually something very stupid as a result of that. I'm left feeling one of two things. One, BS, because oftentimes in these situations, like, you just friggin' met. You'd like, ah, uh, um, not the case here. But then that brings up number two. It's like, okay, you have sunk so much of yourself into this, like, this whole idea of, like, true love and it annoys me in both directions. It annoys me when I see it as like their love is so strong that it will, that this person will do anything for them. And I don't like that as a narrative thing. Partly because like, I just have a hard time wrapping my head around it. And like, I get that, you know, people get into relationships and get so committed to that other person or what they believe the relationship to be that they do stupid things or selfish things or destructive things. Like, I get all that. But when it gets amplified to the degree that it often does in these stories where heroes basically choose their loved one over everything else and the freaking fate of the world, like, occasionally that can work if it's a snap decision. Where it doesn't work is where it takes time. And, like, you are devoting, in his case here, centuries. And at no point along this path do you stop and reflect and go, wait a damn minute. And like, again, there's token acknowledgments of that. There's like the, again, very cliched line, I can't stop now, I've come too far, blah, blah, blah. So like, there's these token acknowledgments that what he's doing is stupid and he should be self-reflective of it. But again, it's something that I see so much and I have never liked. And at this point, I'm just worn so thin on it. And so this... This thing is really, in a lot of ways, a pileup of just elements I don't like. It doesn't mean the story's actually bad in any kind of objective sense. It just means, to my taste, as someone who has seen way, way too many time travel or time loop or time paradox movies and stories to be surprised by anything this have, has to offer, 
who has been for way too long seeing way too many stories that pin on the idea of, oh, true love, either the power of it or the damage caused by the loss of it, and is tired of that, and just gets worn down by it no matter how it's deployed at this friggin' point in time, and, like, layering those things on, like, this is just something that I'm bored with, with something that I don't like stacked on top of it. Again, my tastes... My my feelings on this, you don't have to share your opinion. I don't think you're dumb if you did like this, but just... Uh, I, I, went, I, I started bored and then got annoyed. Yeah! I think the one thing that was interesting about this was this is the first time that we really had the Watcher become a participant to some degree. He still doesn't step in, but he does interact with Strange. So it really does feel like the show is steadily building his involvement from episode to episode. Because um, I noted last time that, like, I noticed him in the background a heck of a lot more. And some other people mentioned in the comments that, like, he'd been in earlier ones, but he was way more prominent and visible in the third one. So they seem to be upping his participation level with each episode. And I'll be curious to see where that's going. But that's kind of my one positive takeaway from this one. It just isn't doing anything I like. It's not doing a core narrative plot that I find very interesting, and it's not doing a thematics that I enjoy at all. So, <laughs> what if episode four? I don't know what I'm going to do when the um, show's over. I, like, I don't know if it'll make sense to do any kind of a big thesis piece on it like I did with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Maybe when it's done, I'll just like do a ranking of, uh, of the episodes. Uh, and if I do it that way, uh, I'm going to say it right now, provisionally, this is at the bottom. What if, episode four, what'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. So let's talk about it. I got a Patreon. It's how I pay my bills and keep this whole operation up and running. No pressure, though, because the like, share, subscribe trifecta help me out as well. Hit the bell. Why not? No real pressure, though. Take a relaxed attitude around here, so just come on back next time you need a break. I need one now.